Hello, and welcome to Both Sides of the Bars. My name is Andre Ward, and I'm the Associate Vice President for the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. We thank you for joining us today for this show, and we hope that you and your family members and loved ones are safe and well during this time of COVID-19 and what's happening in the communities of color in the world. Today, we wanna to talk about fair chance housing. And I'm joined by two experts in the field who will talk about um, the impact of fair chance housing and what does that mean? While New York State's uh, law to prevent discrimination against people with criminal uh, records and employment have existed for decades, um, there are no protections for people seeking housing um, other than housing funded by this New York State. All other landlords can refuse to rent homes to anyone who has ever been arrested, no matter how minor the offense or how long ago it occurred. With at least 50% of those released from incarceration ending up in shelters, coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important, um, more important than ever, to offer them supportive permanent housing. Today, we have experts from the field that will discuss these things um, while you're talking to us and listening to us. So thank you so much for joining us today. We have um, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Allison Wilkie. And Allison Wilkie serves as the Director of Public Policy for the Institute for Justice and Opportunity at John Jay College. And then we have Margaret Desarega. And Margaret Desarega is the Acting Director of Sentencing and Corrections at the Vera Institute. Colleague, thank you so much for joining us here at Both Sides of the Bars. How are you feeling today? Great, and thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks, Andre. Absolutely. Andrei. And I want to get right into it. And, you know, obviously I would be remiss, you know, we're in also a critical time now um, as it relates to race and racism and the impact of police brutality on Black people and people of color. Um, and all of this stuff is kind of tied together in many different ways, right? People being impacted by the criminal legal system or incarcerated in mass, people of color, um, which impacts them in so many different ways as it relates to employment housing and, and other opportunities. Um, but in your area in particular, right, we know that people who have justice involvement have been historically excluded from accessing housing. Um, and while employment, um, I mean, ways to protect people for employment has been on the books, right? right? There's legislation around that. It hasn't been anything really from people for housing. So Allison, I wanna to talk to you Right, about give us some historical context. Like, how do we get here, right, around this fair chance housing work? And then we'll shift to you, Margaret, to talk about the work you've done um, around public housing and the research there. So, Allison? Thanks, Andre. And I think you're right to call out this moment that we're at right now where communities across the United States are protesting against police violence. And, you know, my hope is that as we move forward and as we try and push policy change, we're not just trying to change policies around policing and police brutality. We really need to examine the entire criminal legal system and how the criminal legal system and its consequences get imported into other kinds of systems and other kinds of systemic racism. And I think you see that a lot in housing. If you look at the roots of what we call fair chance housing or fair chance for housing, it really harkens back to the 1968 Fair Housing Act which purported to eliminate or prohibit discrimination based on race and other intrinsic characteristics. But over the years since then, what we've seen is that a criminal record becomes a proxy for race. A criminal record is how landlords exclude people because we know that the criminal legal system disproportionately impacts people of color. So uh, about 90% of housing providers do background checks that's a staggering number. And if you look at some of the statistics around who was impacted by the criminal legal system, we know that one in three black men uh, have a felony conviction in the United States. Black men are targeted by policing. They fare worse in our criminal legal system. And then all of that gets imported into when people are trying to find housing and they face that question, do you have a conviction history? I mean, Margaret, you've done some research around um, this idea of people, permanent exclusion for people in NYCHA housing, I think in 2017, and that body of research, I'm sure is quite relevant today. So talk to us about that body of research you've done, Margaret, and how is it relevant today? How does it jive on what's happening today around housing? Sure. So I think 
what we see, what we see, see is that you know in our sort of tough on America's tough on crime era, um, policies were put in place to encourage public housing authorities, in particular, to you know quote unquote clean up the developments. And I think there were there was some amount of perhaps legitimate attention to wanting to improve safety for all residents living in public housing nationwide, but like a lot of criminal justice policies, it went too far. And so there was encouragement from, from HUD and, and others for, for public housing authorities and other landlords to really screen out people with conviction histories um, and these sort of one strike and you're out type approach. And I think the, those sorts of exclusionary policies get play, you know, play out differently in different housing authorities. Um, what we know is that housing authorities have a ton of discretion over their admissions policies. And I think where initially they were encouraged to just exclude everybody possible, now there's a little bit of a tide turning to where housing authorities are more, um, they're more open to think about how housing can be a, a key piece of successful reentry for people coming out of uh, prison or jail or you know, people on probation. Um, so fortunately, there's some there's some shifting that we're seeing now, and there's way more room to go. But there are some positive things we can look at. So I so I guess that's where Allison, like you, take things up right in the fight for fair chance housing, following what Margaret is saying, because we know that while initially you know there was like complete like non-responsiveness right to support people accessing housing with justice involvement. Now you said there's a little traction with that, but we know that like. It offers like support to families when you let people get access back to housing. It certainly increases public safety rather than like decreases it. So Allison, like talk to us following Margaret's thought. Talk to us about that. Like what do those things mean relative to what's happening with the work you're doing now at Fair Chance Housing? Yeah, I mean, our Fair Chance for Housing work really starts with the premise that everybody deserves a place to call home that having a safe and stable home is really the foundation for success in every other aspect of your life. And by continuing to not deny people housing, we're denying people the ability to support their families. We're denying people the ability to really have gainful employment and maintain it. We're denying people the ability to fully participate in their communities. So housing really is one of these foundational things. And, and our campaign really comes at this from the perspective that it is a human right. Now, we have seen um, Fair Chance for Housing ordinances passed in 13 jurisdictions across the United States so far. And there's been wide variation in what has been passed. For some of those ordinances, it is simply, it simply covers city-funded or local fund, locally funded housing. For some of them, it goes much broader. And there's still variation on what types of housing it covers. Does it cover owner-occupied housing? And one of the big fundamental differences is what does it look like? In employment, we've seen the ban the box model where uh, laws have been passed saying that employers can't ask you about your conviction history on the application, but later on in the process when they're ready to make an offer of employment, they are able to access your conviction history and scrutinize it and deny you the job at the end of that um, if they choose to. And we've seen that model uh, imported into some of these fair chance for housing ordinances. We've also seen jurisdictions who really have taken to heart the idea that housing is a human right. It's a fundamental human need. And they have essentially banned background checks in housing. And the three jurisdictions who have really gone the furthest in this are Seattle, Washington, Berkeley, California, and Oakland, California, where there is almost a complete prohibition on the use of background checks in all types of housing. So we can really take these policies and push them to really open up housing. And I think it is important to note that Fair Chance for Housing expands access to housing. It is not the one be all end all solution for housing for people who are exiting jails and prisons or people who've been in, in the criminal justice system. There is still a need to build different types of housing, to have supportive housing, to have housing that addresses people per, people's particular needs. But it's a fairly quick way to expand access to housing because it doesn't require you to build new housing. It doesn't require you to convert housing. It really just expands what is already available and opens up that pool available of available housing. There is some research in New York that showed that having a conviction history 
reduces the likelihood that a landlord will allow you to even view an apartment by 50%. So these are real, and our campaign members face this discrimination every day. They're trying to find housing, they're trying to find stability in their lives, they apply for housing and they are denied because of a criminal record. So in New York City, we are really trying to push a comprehensive law that eliminates background checks. And Margaret, you know, I know in the body of research that you've done, right, this idea of taxpayers' money, their savings in that way, right? You don't have to, to Allison's point, you don't have to construct and build new housing, right? You're allowing people to enter into existing housing with family or just other housing. Talk about like some of your research around like the savings piece to that and other related like comments on that. Sure. So absolutely, we know that, you know, the majority of people leaving prisons and jails have family or some other kind of social support that wants to welcome them back home. And, um, you know, when I think about this particular issue of family reunification, you know, however one defines family, um, there's a there's a family from NYCHA housing that I, I always think of because there was a, a mom and three children were in the NYCHA apartment, the, the dad was coming out of prison and in order for the family to maintain their housing, they were renting a room for him elsewhere in the city. Now that money that they were using to give him housing elsewhere could surely have been put to better purpose. Um, but they, you know, they wanted to follow the, the rules, they wanted to keep the family's housing secure and, in NYCHA. And so Fortunately, NYCHA created a family reentry program uh, that we and Corporation for Supportive Housing, Fortune Society, and a bunch of other uh, partners in New York City came, came up with together. And so he was able to apply for this family reentry program and move back in with his family. They didn't have to rent that extra room. And then eventually he was able to get on the lease. And he become, you know, they they are like any other NYCHA family where his income, because his, you know, he was progressing through his job, his income is now factored into the family's rent calculation. Um, he is officially on the lease. So all of those sorts of things are secure. And I think the um, when we work with public housing authorities around the country, there's a real willingness to think about family reunification in this way because they are all they are all dealing with the lack of affordable housing in their communities, the high demand, particularly um, for people with lower incomes, and you know compounding that with the discrimination folks face in the in the rental market. Um, it just makes sense that if people can come home with family that's already in public housing, uh, that and the family wants to welcome them back, that they should be able to do that. They should have a pathway to being on the lease. Um, so, so that is an area where we're seeing a lot of interest from other housing authorities. I think the reentry service community um, has certainly been promoting that for a long time. And it's just about sort of bringing those partners to the table, helping them understand what one another kind of brings to the equation and, and developing these programs together. And then one really critical piece is making sure the word gets out to folks. So once these programs are created, um, you know, the service providers in particular are working with their clients and trying to overcome like years of distrust with the housing authority and knowing that there were one strike policies and all those sorts of things. So how can providers and, and other community members help get the word out that these programs are real opportunities for people to join their household, get on the lease and not have to live in the shadows and, and fear eviction? Can I can I interject real quick? Because I sure. think Margaret raises a really good point and a really good lens that we both bring to our work, that this is about families. It's not just about individuals, that this impacts entire families. And so the work that Margaret is doing is so important in allowing people to return home to their families. And the work that we do, we also think about how that when someone is applying for housing, it's often not just on their own behalf, it's on behalf of their whole family. And if you have, if you as the person applying for housing, or if you have a family member who has a conviction history, it is the entire family that is excluded from housing. So this impacts children, this impacts spouses, this impacts generations. 
And I think that's just an, a really important element and lens that we all keep in mind here. This is not just about individuals and individuals being punished. We're punishing families by not allowing people access to housing. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things we learned when we did the evaluation of NYCHA's family reentry program is that um, both member, you know, all the members of the household benefit when they are together. So, for example, um, some of the program participants were, you know, adults in their 40s returning back to live with mom who might live alone. And mom would talk about the value in, you know, not only having her son home and the comfort that that provides, but also like concrete support around, you know, grocery shopping, helping get to doctor's appointments and that sort of thing. And we heard from a lot of program participants that moms in particular, but I'm sure other household members also, were also helping, helping them reach their goals, be it around um, you know, job applications or, or other sorts of goals that they had related to supervision, but also um, their own sort of goals and dreams. And so seeing that there's really that mutual support that family members provide each other, and we all know that to be true from our own lives, but um, I think lifting up those examples for the housing authorities and others who are considering these kinds of changes has been really helpful. Now, all of what each of you just raised like makes perfect sense, right? But to others, it may seem to insult logic and reason, right, to do something like that. But we know, right, it saves taxpayer dollars, right? You don't have people housed in jail, spending over $100,000, $200,000 a year to house a person, right? People are unified together. People are being able to build together as a family, sometimes in relationships that were like once broken. Because when people are returning now to their families after maybe some time in jail, some family members may feel, okay, they finally got it together, right? They, their thinking is clearer, they're back, and now we can kind of build. So why not the funding for it? That's the question, guys. Like, why not the funding? Like, why isn't this like this thing that's so clear and glaring, right, that each of you articulated, why isn't it being supported? I'll start with you, Alice, and I'll see you like ready to go. Well, so I think what I hear a lot is the word safety. And I want to invite us all to, to critically examine that word safety because it's, it's important in this context of police brutality that we have been permissive of state violence against black and brown people. We have been permissive of police officers killing people in NYCHA, and I'm speaking particularly of Akai Gurley, who was killed in 2014 while he was walking down the stairs with his girlfriend, unarmed, engaged in no criminal activity. And we're permissive. We allow that. But then when we talk about allowing families to be together, suddenly the specter of safety comes in. And so whose safety are we talking about? And I think we need to really examine the racist under underpinnings of that word safety and whose safety we're concerned with. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it is, it's very logical that people would want to return home and live with their family wherever their family's living. Um, I think, you know, when I talk with folks who work in public housing authorities around the country, they are very, um, they feel very protective over the residents who are in public housing. And I often hear questions about, well, what about our senior citizen developments? We wouldn't want someone taking advantage of an, of an elderly relative and that sort of thing. Um, and I think there's ways to work through those conversations and to talk about you know, how family members can be involved in making clear that they, they want to welcome their loved one home. I also have seen a lot of great conversations when we have, you know, experts on in parole, for example, or probation, talking with the housing authorities about how they think about risk and what do what's the difference between the how a conviction might look on a piece of paper and what the person did while they were incarcerated and what they're doing now. Um, and similarly, when you know case managers or people who've been formerly incarcerated who are working in reentry services are talking about their clients who they're advocating for to get back into housing. Um, I think you see a lot of sort of minds opening and heart softening. Um, and a lot of it is really 
sort of basic work around dismantling stereotypes and biases about who's in the justice system and and what their potential is once they come home. Um, and so I think the more kind of face-to-face uh, -face interactions people can have, of course, uh, feels ironic to say that right now when none of us are having face-to-face -face interactions, but the more we can put people you know, in proximity to one another and try to break down some of those barriers, I think that really has helped open up conversations about why supporting reentry housing is so important. Um, and you know, there was a housing authority director I spoke with in Ohio who had read the new Jim Crow, and this was maybe five, six years ago, and it really was like a light bulb went off for her. And she had every member of the housing authority board read it. And they had conversations about it, and they're now thinking of, and then they created a reentry program as a result. Um, and then even this last week, you know, someone from another housing authority reached out and said, we are, you know, we're seeing the news, we're seeing the discussions about structural racism. What should we be doing differently about our policies to make sure we are not furthering those ideologies, um, which was a really stunning email to receive in the midst of all of this. But um, I think people are hopefully gonna be even more open to approaching their policies and, and perspectives differently now. And that like moves us right to Allison, right? And obviously the push to make sure that these things, that we have some real legislative wins, right? Around fair chance housing through coalition building that Allison has done a great job of doing and partnering with the Fortune Society on this kind of work. So Allison, what are we doing, right? Because we're getting ready to do something now, right? And I think that's what it's all about, segueing right away from what Margaret said into this idea of raising awareness, but making sure it's out there. So talk to us right. about what's happening. Right, absolutely. So our Fair Chance for Housing campaign is convening and growing, and we invite everyone to participate in it. Uh, you can learn more about it at fairchancehousing.org. You can click on the Take Action button, and uh, you can sign a petition as an individual. You can sign on as an organization. You can be part of the campaign. You can subscribe to get email updates from us. So we are ready and we can get involved. We are trying to push legislation in New York City that would eliminate background checks. And we are rallying. We've got events coming up. Um, we are really pushing forward um, to try and get this legislation passed because I think there is a moment here where we are looking at where the criminal legal system intersects with all of these other systems. And we need to grab hold of that moment and really push forward and, and make this happen for New York City. Absolutely, too. And, you know, obviously, we we're approaching closing of the show. Unfortunately, time is never our friend in this sense sometimes. But um, I'd like to just hear some closing remarks from each of you um, about we know what each of you envision, obviously. We want fair chance housing for all. Um, some of the things that you think people can be in action with doing, right, to support that. You mentioned Allison, obviously, joint uh, going on, logging on to fairchancehousing.org um, to get access to information. But talk to me about some actionable things that people can do, Margaret and Allison, just to be involved and to join and move this forward. Yeah, so um, I'll start. Um, I think. I think what Margaret raised before is actually really important about what people can do in their er everyday lives, which is about breaking down stereotypes and having conversations with people and putting a human face on who was in our criminal justice system. I think that that's incredibly important because it, we have a narrative that gets propelled by the media, gets propelled by the storytelling in our country, that people who have been in the justice system are bad people, that they're incorrigible. Um, that they've done things that are particularly heinous. And that's simply not true. Um, you know, we, we know from the disproportionate policing of communities of color that communities of color are targeted for things that other communities are not targeted for. Uh, we know that people in the criminal legal system are people's sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and parents. I mean, these are humans and I think we're being invited in this moment to value human life. And I think people can get involved by trying to just break down those stereotypes and to, to everyone around them and really understand what our criminal legal system is and how it impacts all these other areas of people's lives. 
and how it really results in a system of perpetual punishment for people once they exit the system. You know, it, it, we have this idea that people serve their time and they're done, but that's not true. It is a system of perpetual punishment. People still face barriers as they try and get housing, as they try and get employment, as they go through higher education. There's all, all different kinds of barriers that folks face. And so we need to start dismantling that entire system and really value the dignity of, of each life. Yeah, and some would offer it had to be a complete overall. Uh, Margaret? Yeah, I'll keep it brief, but I, I think um, it is astounding to me all the ways that we bake in the criminal background policies um, and housing is certainly one prime area. So I think you know, one thing people can do right away is look at, you know, even where they live and their own building, if you're in an apartment building or condo complex, and, and look at what the criminal background policy really is, and maybe start asking some questions about why is it like this, and what, what are some other options. Um, and then to people who are in a position to talk with a local housing authority, I think there's a similar conversation to be had, and really encouraging housing authorities, particularly now when you know we're hoping more jails and prisons will continue to decarcerate in the face of this pandemic more housing authorities need to be thinking about how they can be a welcome place for people to return allison wilkie margaret desegra sorry that we have to end the show but thank you so much for joining us um, and thank you listening audience for joining us on both sides of the bars we have been discussing fair chance housing with allison wilkie and margaret Desarega. I just want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. Um, please make sure that you tune into our show. Um, we will be back. Um, but during this time of change and challenge and pain and hurt, we ask that you move to a place of healing and support for each other and get involved in all those things that can change the way that we are experiencing life today. My name is Andre Ward. Again, thank you for joining us at Both Sides of the Bars. Mm -hmm.